Good afternoon or good morning, depending on where you're joining us from. Um, I hope you've been enjoying the conference so far. I'm Adam Tim. Nice to see you. Uh, question for you just to get us started. Did you know that a recent study found that 70% of change initiatives fell short of the expectations set by the leaders who ushered in or started that change initiative? 70% have been deemed a failure. Another study found that with the pace of change quickening, that our ability to change during this fast paced time is becoming more and more diminished. And when it comes to our industry, when it comes to 911, uh, I found in my conversations with dispatchers and leaders, managers, directors all across the country that the need for change in our profession specifically is required as we move boldly into the future of 911. And wouldn't it be cool if you had some tools, some perspectives, some strategies that you could use to drive change more successfully at your center? Wouldn't that be cool? Uh, that's what we're going to be talking about today. Um, I'm the head of change management here at Rapid Deploy, uh, but I speak from my own experience of working in the center. Uh, I spent 10 years as a dispatcher for the Los Angeles Police Department. And after I left the LAPD as a frontline telecommunicator, I started my training and consulting company, The Healthy Dispatcher. And over the last four or five years, I've been crisscrossing the country with the desire to understand what the best communication centers in this country do differently than the rest. And I have found that of the 7,000 communications centers, 7,000 or so PSAPs in this country, that a very small percentage know what it takes to drive positive change and to make them a reality. And I'd like you to consider all of the challenges that we face today as an industry. I mean, most immediate, we have the pandemic on our hands. We have protests in cities all across the country. Uh, if that weren't enough, that was already on top of the next gen 911 challenges, the people challenges. And it might feel like we are fighting this inevitable spiral downward. Most centers are riding this hamster wheel of the cycle, what I call the cycle of dissatisfaction. Our staffing situation, meaning how many people you have staffed at your center, if you are uh, less than fully staffed, it's likely that you uh, have an overtime situation and your overtime situation causes people to be dissatisfied with working with working conditions, uh, which causes them to leave, which further impacts the staffing situation, which leads to more overtime and greater levels of dissatisfaction. And unfortunately for our industry, we've been in this so-called staffing crisis uh, since APCO initially declared it as such in 1999, um, which the, the initial study for the project, APCO project retains was commissioned in 1999, uh, but their study came out in 2005. Since then, it, it may feel like if you are a leader at your center, if you are a frontline telecommunicator and have been since this time, it may feel like things haven't changed much. And as I've been running around the country, I've been really, really curious about the centers that have made change possible. How have they done this? And I, I've documented in my most recent book um, called People Driven Leadership, how the best 911 centers inspire positive change. Um, and I released this book after doing about four years of research, talking with managers and directors and supervisors at centers that have opted for something different. They've decided that the way we've always done it isn't working any longer, or maybe it never did. And they decided to implement solutions. They decided to break out of this kind of blame game mentality. The best centers have decided to take a different approach to get to their goals, to get to where they need to be. Um, I, and I love this, uh, I love the story that this slide here in particular 
tells us. What this slide is telling us is that in order to move from where you currently are, your current reality, to where you want to be, which is the goal, there's this gap. And it's this winding, twisting path to bridge this gap. And it's not just any gap. This gap is a behavior gap. In order to make positive change a possibility at your center, and it doesn't matter what type of change it is, whether it's a technology change, whether it's a new training program, whether it's new hiring and recruitment, whether it's just a, a simple new policy, in order to make positive change a reality, you have to change the behaviors and mindsets that currently hold you, that currently hold you in the place that you find yourself. That's why it's so difficult to change. I've found, uh, I've done, aside from training classes, I've, uh, I've done training classes for five to, I, I estimate between five and 7,000 dispatchers, uh, training classes at, at dispatch centers all across the country. In addition to the training classes that I've done uh, over the years, I've done breakout sessions at conferences, the APCO conferences, the NINA conference, Navigator, um, and I have done informal polls where I've asked the participants in my sessions, please raise your hand if you would like positive changes to happen at your center. Overwhelmingly, 95 to 99% of those in the room with several hundred participants in the session, overwhelmingly, most, the vast majority raise their hand and say, yes, I would like positive changes to happen in my center. The follow-up question is, okay, who's going to change? Who wants to change? in order for those changes to happen. Crickets. We all want change, but very few of us are willing to make the changes required to get there. So what do you do? What do you do? There are three specific steps that I found the best leaders in our industry take and practice again and again and again, anytime they are implementing a change. And we cannot delay, we cannot waste time right now because there is so much at stake. So I wanna share with you the, top, the, the, the most important three steps that you need to take as a leader at your center in order to make positive change possible and do so as quickly as possible. The first step, the first important step uh, begins with something that John Maxwell, leadership guru, author, coach, um, you've probably heard of John Maxwell, he's written many, many books. Um, John Maxwell calls this the indispensable quality of a leader. What is it? What do you think it is? It starts with a V. Vision. The first step is for you as the leader to, ha to have a vision. What's possible for your center if you are able to successfully navigate the change before you? And it's, it's, it's the big picture. Your vision is the big picture. And once you have your vision in mind, whatever that goal is, whatever you think it means for your center, uh, you have to begin to think about your vision in terms that matter for your people. And if you can distill your vision, your big picture vision into your center's purpose, mission statement, and your values statement, and you can begin to share it your vision, begin to share your vision in terms that matter to your people, you will be better able to align all of the various elements that need to come together in order to make positive change a reality. So step one, have a vision, tap into a big picture vision. Uh, the best visions are inspirational. The best visions uh, are humanizing. Uh, the best visions make it clear what the next steps are and 
uh, get us excited to move in that direction. Uh, the second step is you're going to need to break that vision down into very clear expectations and goals that matter to your team. And you have to be able to communicate these expectations and goals in a very clear and succinct way for your people. One of the leaders that I interviewed for my book, and she, she recently retired uh, after 38 years in 911. Um, I had heard stories of her impact, her positive impact, before I finally had a chance to interview her. And uh, I asked her, what is your secret? I, I've heard so many good things uh, about the people who have worked with you and for you over the years. Uh, so many good things about the way you lead. So many things, good things about the way you show up each day. Um, what is one of the principles that you live by that make people say that you are such a great leader? And she said, well, first of all, thanks so much. I, uh, it's, it's humbling to hear that feedback. Um, but for me, it's communication. I communicate, I communicate, and I communicate again. When there is a change happening at our center, my people can never tell me that they didn't know it was going to happen because I get out in front of it. I start communicating way, way before than I think I even need to. And uh, part of the reason is because I believe in radical transparency. I believe that when we give our people the information that is going to impact them, it makes them better able to adapt with it, to roll with it, and to get behind it. And uh, I just love that. Communicate, communicate, and communicate again. And you might be thinking to yourself, well, that's easier said than done. And certainly, being a clear communicator, or if I say just be a better communicator, it's much easier said than done. Because uh, in our profession, we work in communications, but we don't communicate very well. Why is that? Why is that? Well, think about your own personal approach to communication. Why do you find, or why do you think that your message may not be landing in the way that you intended? I have a feeling and this is only based on uh, conversations that I've, I've had over the years with those who work in our profession, I have a feeling that what you are saying, meaning the actual words that are coming out of your mouth, are completely drowned out by how you're saying it, meaning maybe your nonverbals, maybe your tone, uh, maybe your face uh, isn't conducive to your message landing in a way that works for your people. Now, this is a, this is a tough a tough thing to do. If you want to know how effective of a communicator you are, um, the next time you're having a one-on-one -on -one exchange with one of your employees, one of your team members, I encourage you to ask this question. Hey, uh, before you go, and you can introduce this, uh, this question in any, any type of one-on-one -on -one exchange meaning a quality assurance call monitoring review, uh, just a, a quick stop by the, the console as you're walking the floor before you start your shift. Uh, just ask this question. How am I as a communicator? Do you feel like uh, you understand the message I'm trying to convey on a regular basis? And if you have the courage to ask that question, uh, the next step is to uh, be quiet and just listen. Uh, I find that uh, oftentimes communication breakdowns happen because we're not very good listeners. There are so many things competing for our time and attention. We're very, very distracted. Plus you're a heroic multitasker. That's just part of working in this profession. Um, and as a result, our lack of listening prevents empathy from happening you will be a much more effective communicator if you can begin to meet your people where they are at. If you can begin to see the ship through your crew's eyes. It's all about empathy. The best leaders in our profession at comm centers all across the country are the best at empathizing with their people, which is why they communicate, communicate, and communicate 
again, which is why they have a big vision and it matters to their people. It's a vision that their people can rally around. And this is, this is a very important skill uh, as a leader to be, being able to get people to rally behind the aims of the center. Uh, because what happens when we're not able to get everybody going in the same direction, most who work in this profession are type A overachievers. And I don't know any type A overachiever who doesn't want to be a part of a high performing team, who doesn't want to be a part of making a difference, some lofty aspiration uh, that, that doesn't want to be a part of making sure uh, the responding units, the field units go home safe every single night. If we're not sharing our vision and we're not communicating it in a clear way, we're preventing people from seeing the importance of their daily actions in the comm center each and every day. And we're preventing powerful synergies from happening. So step one, have a vision. Step two, communicate that vision clearly in a way that matters to your people. And step three, and in fact, I'll, I'll say that step three is possibly the most important uh, because if you don't start talking about what it means to articulate the aims uh, and to behave in the way that your aim and your vision means, then we shouldn't be surprised that your, uh, that your vision is just kind of a guideline. Your vision is just some lofty words. Step three is to hold your people accountable and provide regular feedback on how they're doing, actualizing the potential of that vision. Because as we start to move in the direction of solutions, even as we start to find gains, I've seen change initiatives that were initially proving dividends abandoned midstream because we didn't keep talking about it. We didn't keep holding each other accountable for its eventual result, whatever that is. So you have to hold, hold fast to that vision uh, because so often, we bungle this neutral zone. What the slide here in front of you is, is telling uh, us is that ushering in any change, however small, necessarily requires endings to the old way. And even if the old way didn't work, it never worked, even if the old way was dysfunctional and created low morale and didn't foster team camaraderie, people will still mourn the passing of the old way. And as the ending of the old way draws to a close, there is a gap from that time to when the new beginnings take root. And that gap is represented by this neutral zone. It is when you are kind of wandering in this void that is the vacuum of the neutral zone where most positive change in initiatives fail. Only by communicating on a regular basis and doing so clearly and holding people accountable can you make the leap confidently into the new beginning. Uh, so I'm curious, what action do you need to take in your leadership role today to tap into this bigger vision, to communicate that vision more clearly and to hold everybody, including yourself, more accountable for the achievements, for the goals, for the objectives that we are all committing to getting done. And as you take one bite-sized piece, it will knock the dominoes into the next one, into the next one, into the next one, until you have forward momentum. 
because we are so set in our ways, because my way works and I'm a type A perfectionist, uh, we need to start notching gains. We need to we need to start moving the dial a little bit to bust out of the resting inertia that holds us in our stuck place. And bite-sized pizzas, rapid cycle, small projects can help you begin to build that momentum. Um, so what are you committing to? What are you committing to for you? What are you committing to, to for your team? And how are you going to measure success as you start to see it happen? Um, that's another thing that will help you move beyond or through the neutral zone is having clear metrics clear metrics for success that you are sharing with your people along the way. Change creates uncertainty. It creates anxiety. And if you are measuring the gains and reflecting those gains back to your people in terms that matter to them, they will continue to be on board. And from the biggest perspective, um, what you're asking, what you're answering for your people by following these three steps is why? Why are we working so hard? What are we here doing as a team? And that why, that big why, if you start with why, it will be much easier to bring your team together in an ongoing way. Um, we have a few minutes left for questions. I, I would really like to know, and I didn't say this uh, in, in the beginning, um, but I would really like to know what kind of questions you have uh, about the changes that you are currently facing at your center um, when, it, when it comes to technology, when it comes to people, when it comes to processes. What changes or what questions do you have um, when it comes to the work that you are doing, and it's sometimes unforgiving work, it's thankless, a thankless job being in a leadership role. It can be lonely at the top. Um, absolutely. So what questions do you have about navigating, successfully navigating change at your center? And if there's no questions, then I'll certainly open the floor to, uh, I, I, I am unable to see if you're joining us live. So we would love to, uh, to, to hear from uh, who's ever joining here. And we'll just wait for the questions to come in. And if you do have questions, you can just type in the, the questions in the chat window, the chat box, and we will get them and they will, uh, they will share the questions directly with me. I'm not able to see the chat window, but you can type in the chat and the chat, the chat window is being monitored. Great question just came in. How do you manage the team's expectations of what they believe should be communicated? So I, uh, I love the phrasing of that question. How do you manage team's expectations of what they believe should be communicated? Um, your, your vision is only as powerful as it is valuable to your teams, for, to your team members. Uh, and so in order to understand what your vision might mean to your people, uh, you got to have conversations with them. You have to talk about, uh, talk to them about their anxieties, talk to them uh, about uh, what they feel is the direction that the center could take. And you can contextualize those conversations um, in a very clear way. But really just keeping an ear open will help you kind of understand how to share your vision in a way that matters to them. Uh, I find that many, um, many who, who are in leadership roles, uh, they're really good at telling people what to do. 
uh, because that's what we do as uh, as dispatchers. Your success in the job is determined by how good you are at telling people what to do. Um, when you are sharing your vision, you you can't tell people this is the vision and here's here's where we're going. You instead uh, need to invite people into seeing your vision, but on their terms. And think about that. There is a dynamic interplay that has to happen. You're going to have to ask more questions. You're going to have to uh, get more information from your team members in order to fit your vision into how they think and feel and uh, about the world that they believe in. How do you handle those that resist some of the change or are determined to undermine it? A wonderful question. I find that at uh, comm centers all across the country, there is about 10% of the total population, which are the most vocally negative. Uh, the 10% of the total working population, I call them the toxic 10%, who will threaten to derail any change initiative. Why? Because it's change. Why? Because they weren't consulted. Why? Because they've been ar around the longest and they know best. How do you bring those people on board? Again, we have to talk with them. And uh, there was a, there's a great story out of, um, out of Florida. Uh, this happened back in 2010. The new director took over to, uh, to oversee a consolidation effort. And the team was going from 64 pre-consolidation to 145 total employees post-consolidation. And he knew that if he didn't solve the problems that the center faced before they brought everyone together, these problems will persist. And so he sat down with all 145 employees and he asked them, hey, what's going on here? Um, uh, first of all, he introduced himself. Hey, I'm, uh, I'm here to make things better. Um, what do you think the problems are? And what do you think are some of the solutions to these problems? And he noticed that about 10% of the total population, 12 to 14 people, um, were the most vocally vocal about what the problems were. They, had, they, they swerved kind of, or veered kind of towards the negative side of things. And uh, what he did next, this, this, uh, this incoming director was pretty amazing. After he had talked with everybody, he was convening a series of committees and he went to the most vocally negative 10%. And he said, hey, you know, I, I noticed uh, in our previous conversations, by the way, thank you so much for sharing your mind, speaking your mind and sharing um, the way you see things. Um, I noticed that you know what's wrong with this place. Won't you be on the morale committee to help develop policies and procedures to make things better? Yes, he turned those toxic 10% into informal change agents for the change initiative. And he was very clear about the steps forward. Um, and again, be clear, but be open, um, especially when dealing with resistance. How can we help better older employees with change? Again, communicate, 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 communicate. Paint the picture of the vision that you see. Only you see the world in it, all of its possibilities in the way that you see it. We have to communicate that vision as leaders much more clearly uh, because the, the default is resistance to change, especially in our profession. But if people can see how it's gonna make their life better, they will rally behind it. Um, what do you suggest as ways to help motivate a manager who is less involved? Um, aside from everything else I've said, if the manager simply will not get on board, you have to start holding them accountable for their behavior. And you must have agree to have difficult conversations. You must be willing to have difficult conversations and set the bar. What you tolerate, you become. If you don't have the courage to set the bar at a high level and say, this is where we need to be, don't we all agree that this is where we need to be? And then hold people accountable to that bar, um, then we shouldn't be surprised that we get derailed, that bad behavior is tolerated, that bad behavior becomes the norm. Uh, great questions. I believe we have like 30 seconds left. I just wanna thank you so much for joining me live. Um, and it was so great 
to be here in front of you. Enjoy the rest of the conference. Get as many sessions as you can in. We have exciting keynotes over the next few days. There's another session uh, immediately after this session. Uh, it's so happy. I'm, I'm so happy to be here with you. Thank you so much for joining me. See you again soon.